Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Wall Street Wildlife Podcast. Today we're tackling two big topics. Firstly, and I'm scared of this one, is Google doomed? Oh no. And secondly, if you have four stocks in your portfolio, is that too concentrated? <laughs> we didn't even rehearse that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a good question. We're going to tackle right. it in this episode of the Wall Street Wildlife Podcast with your hosts, Luke the Badger Hallard and Christoph Monkey Pikarski. All right, Badger, where the hell are you? You uh, moved again. I'm now in beautiful, sunny Lake Tahoe. It wasn't sunny yesterday, though. I've been chasing the snow. So I've been in Park City, Utah for two months. And I saw a tweet about two weeks ago that said uh, the, the Sierras, which comes down to this part of California, Nevada, the Sierras are due to get the biggest storm of the 21st century. So I booked my flights and I arrived here Thursday and the storm came Friday and it has been blizzard conditions, but just like Saturday morning was just the most incredible day on the mountain I've had this season for sure. Oh, that's amazing. <clears throat> for a second, I thought you were lying because all I've been seeing is you sitting at a poker table. <laughs> I'm sending those to you quietly. I've, I've nearly paid my rent for the whole of this month. I've had a pretty good run in my oh, first two wow. sessions. Oh, <laughs> and you're scaring the shit out of me because I know it's coming when you get here to Austin and I have cobwebs all over my poker chips. So, uh, <laughs> I'm ready for you, my friend. I'm oh, ready for you. <laughs> oh, shit. I need to find those Bitcoins under my couch. <laughs> yeah, actually, so uh, I, hopefully there are no local poker players listening to this podcast. But to be quite honest, this is my seventh visit to Lake Tahoe, uh, a town called State Line. It sits on the California-Nevada border. It is just an incredible place. I, just, I think I consider it my second home. I did, I've done two seasons here already, and now I'm back for another month. And... One reason I love it is not just a world-class mountain and a beautiful lake and just an incredible geography and fun people, a really good poker game. And when I say good, I mean a really weak poker game. Oh, uh, so wow. I generally, uh, I generally cover my season costs in the game. In 2020, I think I took about $8,000 out of the game. And in 2023, wow. about $5,000. So it, it offsets the cost of accommodation and lift passes quite nicely. Well, I'm glad you said that because I know just the place where you're going to pay off your whiskey debt to me. All right, <laughs> we're going to we're going to find some rare vintage bottles, my friend. <laughs> Very good. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be in Austin at the end of this month. So I guess we're going to have some fun bonus episodes uh, around early April. That's right. Let's talk about Google. <clears throat> Let's talk about Google because, yeah, I might be winning at the poker table, but I might be about to lose a ton of cash in the actual yeah. portfolio. So this is interesting because over on 7investing, when we were talking about recommending our team best buy, you and Anurban got into quite the fisticuffs about uh, whether it's uh, cheap and, you know, whether it's a great buy, great time to buy, or whether it's a value trap. And then not too long thereafter, I saw that you bought a whole share and change <laughs> <laughs> for the king of the jungle. So you were voting with your money. And I love that because yes. obviously you're not just uh, yapping the yap. What's the bull case? And, and to be clear, like the, uh, I bought, I, I invested $150, which is kind of 10% of my Wall Street wildlife portfolio in Alphabet um, to send a message to Alabama. <laughs> yeah, <buddy. laughs> but, for, but the real, in the real portfolio, which pays my bills and hopefully, you know, looks after my life. This is a very material position. This is like my, generally my second or third biggest stock holding. It's a lot of money. Uh, so yeah, I really do have my money where my mouth is. Yeah. So obviously you're seeing, okay, so let's, let's backtrack. This is still one of the magnificent seven. It's often been talked about as having the best business model in the world. It's kind of run the world for during the entire age of the internet. So basically from 2000 till now. Uh, and you, by making it a big position in your real money portfolio and recently buying it for King of the Jungle, are essentially voting with your money that its best days are not behind it. Correct. So what's the, uh, why buy now? Um, I think it's a very compelling valuation. 
right now. So it's primarily a valuation play. Like this, in my mind, if you cut through all the noise and the nonsense, this is still one of the world's greatest companies with one of the world's greatest business models. And uh, you can buy it now at a cheaper price to earnings ratio than the average of the S&P. Like it's cheaper than the average top 500 stocks in the world. So um, this seems like a no brainer. Okay, so I don't know if you noticed, but I'm not wearing my monkey hat. I'm wearing, I'm breaking out for the first time my special dodo hat yep. because I'm <clears throat> worried about Google. And I think there are superficial reasons and there are deeper reasons. And I think Anurban covered some of these. The superficial one is the price has recently gone down to the tune of what? 8% or so. I don't know if, I mean, it's been on a, on a, slow, slight decline while the rest of the market is wrong. No big deal in and of itself. But the superficial cause is that it had the diversity, equity, inclusion, faux pas, where it turned out its language, Gemini, its language models, its AI models were fed data that I guess you would say without reserve, deliberately skewed toward the woke side. And it became a cultural topic, a, a hot button issue, revealing potentially problems structurally in Google's business. You know, the people, this could not have been done ex accidentally, put it this way. And I think the main critique is when people search for answers in AI, they want data. They do not want somebody interpreting the data through any kind of filtered lens. So it doesn't matter what your own politics are, but when you get answers that are clearly uh, politicized, you know you're not getting the data. I call that still the superficial level. I think you said this uh, on the seven investing debate that it's a cultural snafu. A couple months from now, people will have forgotten it probably. And if I steal man, like the bear case on that argument, because that, that is my view, this is like temporary, it's going to get resolved. Like the worst case here is that there is a deep rooted cultural problem in Google, perhaps from the top, from Sundar, the CEO, and, uh, and that has to be rooted out and turned over. But like you've got Larry and Sergey with their super voting power, potentially stepping back into the company now, if if it's Sundar's reign is over and the company needs to be stripped back, that's potentially very positive for the, for the stock price and perhaps positive for the company long term. Like I love Google. I don't love Sundar specifically. Um, and I'm not a supporter of uh, some of these cultural things we're seeing in the news. It might. I'm a long term holder of this company. Um, it might take a couple of years to turn the ship, but long term, I see value here. This reminds me of the cross points we had earlier this year, or maybe maybe last year's, I'm sorry, last year about Meta. <clears throat> and I want to take this into a further, uh, further direction, which is less savory for me. I don't like Meta as a company. So I was biased against the stock. And when it was over bloated, and its earnings were disappointing, and Zuckerberg was talking about all these huge investments in virtual reality when it's not yet a thing. From my biased perspective, I thought the stock was doomed. Mm -hmm. And then what has it done since? It's made a majestic recovery because in part, to his great credit, Zuckerberg slashed expenses, got the company refocusing on the core business and we haven't really heard any peeps about virtual reality since, though, of course, they're working on it. Yep. But I think the foundations of Facebook were not in jeopardy. That is the one dominant network platform on the planet. And like it or not, use it or not, I don't, but billions of people do. That was not in jeopardy. So they had this completely safe moat. I'm going to jump in and just say, 
we do use it because we are now trying to grow our Instagram channel for Wall Street Wildlife. So here's a great opportunity to do a quick like and subscribe. Go check out at Wall Street Wildlife at Instagram. And I'm recording currently daily videos of complete nonsense, but I'm going through my entire portfolio from smallest absolute dog shit stocks currently to my greatest wins at the end of day 50. So this is a 50 day project. Check us out on Instagram. We're also on the other social networks, but we're trying to build that one. But yeah, anyway, yay, go Mark Zuckerberg. Sorry, carry on. Right, yeah, they're brilliant videos. Uh, <laughs> and I take that back. This is so, I don't use Facebook, the the the, the platform, but I use Instagram uh, in a minor way. But anyway, yes, we do, we do like the Instagram. I think point being that that was clearly, in hindsight, an operational situation where there was fat to cut and they cut it and then we saw the rebound. The thing that worries me most, Badger, about Google and why I'm wearing my dodo hat is extinction events sometimes come from, you know, meteor meteors crash and dinosaurs die. Yep. Dodos get hunted to extinction. I believe one of the guys on the All In podcast mentioned that when you have a monopoly like Google does, that's 92% market share of search, and you begin seeing the direction reverse because it could only go down to say 88% or 87%, what that implies is that the, the future cash flows for the business are in jeopardy because the direction is going backwards. Now this normally would not, I would not panic, but we know, you and I know better than most that AI is now taking over everything, including, I mean, AI is built on data. So we know there's all the money and entrepreneurs in the world are looking at Google's monopoly and licking their chops, like salivating. I, in this moment, can with no amount of certainty think Google will survive this unscathed. And I think the All In Podcast comment that really terrified me, I mean, it's fear and doom, but they said, logistically, if their monopoly share starts going the other direction, the stock price will take an elevator drop to the tune of 50% because it's forward-looking. So no, Google's not going to lose 50% of its search in the next months or years, right? But the stock price absolutely potentially might in forward fashion precede that kind of fear. So, so I agree. Uh, and the world is going through a seismic change now. Like Google's business model has to change because we, we are moving away from search to something more personalized and tailored to the individual user. And so Google probably are going to take a ding. I don't know about a 50% downside, but they probably are going to take a ding at some point as some of these AI tools start to disintermediate like basic search. But I'm looking beyond that. Like I'm looking five years out, right? This, the, here's the reason why I think Google win in this space anyway, right? They have unarguably in my mind the world's greatest ai team in deep mind and uh and those guys are doing a bunch of clever stuff behind the scenes and we're seeing that in tools like gemini but they have other stuff in the wings also and maybe you could debate whether it's open ai or google's deep mind team who are actually you know the real leaders but it's one of those two um alphabet also has the world's largest repository of video data in YouTube growing faster than anyone could ever possibly ever, ever catch them. And you put those two things together because like OpenAI's Sora is now generating video from like a few words of text description. Um, but AI is able to interpret video and understand what's going on. You put those two things together and I think Google has an unassailable moat. Um, and you, you think about, you get a bit science fiction-y and you think about what the future of search could be like i don't i can't yet have gemini on my phone but only because i'm a uk user like if you're a us android user and android is you know 70 percent plus market share of mobile um 
you can now you can now have Gemini as your assistant. And so it's not a big stretch to think that in like a year or two years time, you'll have a personalized video assistant you can just chat to, like your own personalized news reader, giving you, like I say to Google in the morning, like what's on my schedule? Hopefully it didn't hear me there, good. Right. Um, and it'll tell me what's coming up in my calendar and things I should be aware of. Like I could, I could have a video version of that um, on my phone, anticipating my needs, knowing what's in my calendar, knowing what emails I've had, what's on my to-do list, just helping me manage my life. Um, and I, I don't see how anybody else can get a leg up on Google to do that faster, just because they have the data advantage and the intellectual capital in their team. I'm not sure I buy that they are the only ones that can manage these massive amounts of data because, I mean, uh, everything, I agree with everything you said, but also then I immediately think of a company like Apple and they're sitting on such a massive cash pile. Uh, they're going to do something in the night. AI, which brings me actually to the other concept I want to highlight. So far, we've talked about bull and bear. You've made your case. I'm presenting mine. I think there's this third category that occasionally comes up, which I call the too hard bucket, which I think for me requires humility and a kind of awareness that even though I'm a fan of AI and I'm trying to follow the developments, honestly, I don't know enough. I really don't know enough what's going on behind closed doors and I could listen to podcasts like All In and get a take on, you know, Google's corporate structures and whether that's going to be their downfall or whether it's no big deal. But in the end, I don't know. And in something in the face of something like the early stages of AI, where the rate of change is so fast, I honestly cannot with any confidence tell you whether you're right or whether I'm right. Like, I really can't. I, 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 I could wake up tomorrow and both of these scenarios could play out with, with, the, with ease. And I would be left with, well, of course, that's how it turned out. But in this moment, sure. to me, when I get to these two, you know, these kind of tied ambivalent positions, my too hard bucket is useful. I'll put Google in my too hard bucket and I'll wait for the next earnings call and I'll see is there progress against some of these bear cases if yes great I'll become a bull if not I become an obvious bear yeah that's very reasonable I've, I've been a shareholder for I can't remember must be best part of a decade maybe even longer um I feel like I understand this company quite well so you know every investor is different um and I think I understand what's happening on the forefront of AI. Like I subscribe to multiple of these tools. I use them every day. Um, I voraciously follow this news because it interests me. Yeah, so I, I, you know, this, it's perfectly legitimate that we could have different conviction levels around the same thing. I think that's the thing about dodos. <laughs> uh, to go back to what I said earlier, no one sees the extinction event coming. Hmm. And I also have a little bit of skepticism Maybe this is why, maybe this is why the cultural stuff is a, perhaps more worrisome than I initially thought. Because if the structure of the company is, is buzzing along and there's none of these self-inflicted wounds, then I would be more at ease with saying this is a, a speed bump. They have all the data, everything you've said. But if internally the company is out of tune, with a company that massive, sometimes human brains get become, you know, the smartest people become impediments rather than assets. I don't know if that's the case, you know, but, but from everything I've heard, Anurban's critiques as well, like that there's the company doesn't have the, the boss at the tippity top with the clarity of vision that's going to go in there and hack away like an Elon and like a Zuckerberg did. I think it's a little bit too. Do you uh, do you disagree? Maybe, yeah. I think there's going to be a substantial change in leadership in Google in the next year. Um, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And a new leader probably is going to 
cut and cut and burn. Like they have exited a, a ton of people. Like, but it's in the you know the sub ten percent in a few rounds over the last year or two. I don't know that they do an Elon and fire like seventy five percent of the company, but I think we will, we will see some streamlining. They've got to right uh, just to um, just like deal with like their cost challenges. Like it's it's still there's a lot of fat in the organization, no doubt. Yeah, um, I'm worried. Let's leave it. Let's leave it at this. Uh, maybe yeah. this is a little bit of an adage. Sometimes, when a stock is, this is the whole thing about value traps. Sometimes, when a stock is cheap, it's cheap for a reason. And to me, in this moment, it's a little surprising that a behemoth like Google, that does have all the advantages you named, primed for AI disruption, is cheaper than it's been in a long time. From the kind of counterintuitive perspective, that's worrisome because price is an indicator of where people are putting their money. So the big money, for whatever reason, is not bidding the shares higher. Maybe they know something that you and I don't, and it's really worth keeping an eye on. And it's a, at the end of the day, it's a 7% position for me, I think. So like if this went to zero... Well, it's obviously not going to have to go to zero, but if it got 50% worth of its market value and I've lost like 3% of my portfolio, then that doesn't impact me desperately. Maybe this brings us nicely on to the next topic, which is diversification. Right. Exactly for the reason you said, I believe a, a member on the seven investing discord asked us whether a 4%, uh, I'm sorry, diversifying their portfolio amongst four companies is diversified enough? Yeah, I think the, the, the question was, or the comment was, uh, this member who's very active in the Discord, and you do please go check out seveninvesting.com for $1. You can become a member. You can see hundreds of stock recommendations and every month freshly updated conviction reviews. We're now every month updating on all of the companies that we um you know, we are tracking as the lead advisor team and the discord is now becoming an incredibly valuable source of discussion and debate and due diligence. I'm learning a lot from people who know more about some of these companies that I've recommended than I do. Um, it's a really, really constructive conversation. And the in our daily chat uh, topic yesterday, one of our members commented that he had 64% of his portfolio in a top four companies. And is that too concentrated? So let's debate that. Is having two thirds of your portfolio in four stocks too concentrated in your view, Christoph? Well, you answered the question, I think, nicely on my behalf, which is that even if a company like Google, that 7% lost 50% of its value, you only lose 3%. That's something completely negotiable. Um, from my end, I think it is too concentrated, even though I made the hugest investing blunder of my career not too long ago, investing in a pre-revenue company with all kinds of call options because I was overly convinced. And so that was a risk management error. However, Google, I think, is a great case study for this question. Because if you remember or if, if you've been investing for a while, you know that the world's best companies are at one moment on the bleeding edge and the next moment they're dead. Kodak comes to mind for some reason. They, they were everywhere uh, you went and then digital cameras came along and they're dead. Is AI going to be the death of Google or not? I mean, it, it's, it's to be determined, but if you were to lose 25%, because you were wrong and you will be wrong as an investor, that's a massive setback. For me, a minimum of a solid portfolio, core portfolio is 10 companies. Yeah, I, I, I broadly agree. I think probably 12 companies is broadly accepted wisdom to have a diversified portfolio. And there is a, there's a nuance. It's not like, like if I owned 12 companies and they were all growth tech companies, I'm not very diversified. I haven't really got 12 different things. I've got 12 things in the same basket. And if, you know, a certain macro thing like AI comes along, they could all get disintermediated at the same go. Like 12 diversified companies are, you've got some mega caps and you've got some small stuff. You've got things in like healthcare and you've got things in technology and you've maybe got things in retail, you know, lots of different sectors. 
ideally you've got some geographic diversity. You've got companies that are making money in lots of different countries. You've got stuff that's considered high risk and low risk. You know, basically you're looking to say, what are the things that could go wrong in the world and screw my portfolio? And is there like one event that could hit multiple stocks? And you're trying to avoid that concentration of uh, impacts, I guess. Right. And I would add on top of this that we are living in uncertain times. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe there's some times when you could coast a little bit on a more concentrated portfolio. I don't think this is one of those times. Sure. And four seems exceptionally risky, even if you're investing in giant companies, yeah. because and, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And let's not forget, right? Cash is a position. So diversify, diversifying into cash or fixed income, you know, gilts or bonds or T-bills or something. You know, that is, that's a hedge that gives you diversification away from the market. You know, you're basically putting money under the mattress in a safe way. Yeah, sounds good. Mm. And but let's, let's also reflect on uh, the benefits of a concentrated portfolio. So this member, I believe, got to this level of concentration because he held NVIDIA and he held it through actually me saying multiple times over the last year, this is wildly overvalued. And so this member has benefited from sticking with the story. Uh, and he's, that's probably, I imagine, the large part of how he's got to this level of concentration. Now, so if you, if you do diversify or over-diversify, you are losing the ability to sort of, you know, chase one story, one winner, all the way to the moon, as the Redditors would say, right? Um, so there's pros and cons. And if you're younger and you're adding new money to your portfolio every month, then actually you can take these kind of risks because if you do get wiped out by like 25% because something crazy goes wrong, you've still got decades to recover. But if you're an old man like me and you're living on your portfolio, well, you need to manage your risk in a bit of a different way. This is why you can't just copy someone else's portfolio. You've got to understand your own emotions and your own situation and you've got to build a portfolio that you're comfortable with and you know don't don't blow up your life just because you're trying to get those like mega gains like yeah and as someone that right and as someone that's made all the mistakes let me reiterate that it's one thing to become wealthy and it's also another thing to stay wealthy and if you've attained um through skill and luck and some combination thereof a really nice portfolio for yourself my own guidance what i would want to do for myself is then switch frames frameworks and begin thinking in a more protective manner a more defensive manner because it's a different game you're now playing you've won now defend your castle diversify don't diversify, which is a whole nother topic, but begin thinking more defensively. Yep. Speaking of Badger, I have, uh, this isn't in our schedule conversation, but it just came, came to, to me. I, I was hoping to get your opinion on this. You quipped in one of our conversations that there are a lot of investors now that are popping out of the woodwork, <laughs> coming to you saying they're ready to invest. And your response was, Hmm, that to me might be one of the classic signs of a market top. And I don't know if you were jesting, you said because of that, on the back of that, you said now is a good time to trim and that you might have trimmed your own portfolio. My question to you is, how is that, is that market timing? <clears throat> all right, You're so always giving me, let me rephrase. Yeah. You're yeah. always giving me all kinds of shit for trying to time the market and read tea leaves, and I'm um, uh, I'm 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 wondering. Uh, all right, so uh, so I've got a number of friends who I think probably all do listen to this podcast, and yes, you guys have been messaging me. I've had about ten of you in the last six to eight weeks say, "Hey, Luke, got any stock tips?" <laughs> I'm afraid that is a uh, a bear signal for me. <laughs> I'm happy to share uh, my insights with you guys, and I am doing that. Hopefully it's useful. But uh, the fact that you've all popped up now and you're getting excited, unfortunately, tells me that, you know, we're probably nearing uh, 
bubbly territory. Um, so yeah, I'm that's part of my driver for raising more cash. And is that market timing? Um, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. But Badger I'm, the market timer. Badger the market timer. Uh, you need a new t-shirt. <laughs> and I can I can do market timing. <laughs> it's just nobody else can. <laughs> No, it's like it's the uh, it's it's what you said about like protecting um, protecting your situation. Like I I need my portfolio to continue to live the lifestyle I'm living, right? Otherwise, there won't be any ski seasons next year. So um, so yeah, I, I'm, it makes sense to me. I sleep better at night uh, if I've got a little more cash on the sidelines because I got lucky at the end of 2021, and I I think I've I think I made some very very timely market moves but it was luck more than judgment and this time i'm trying to be a bit more diligent and planned about it so yeah i'm currently about 22 percent cash and i'm probably still increasing that over the coming few months i just want to go back to what i said to my friends as well though just quickly uh my situation and your situations are different and so although i'm generating cash and i'm i'm largely fully invested you know probably 80 percent of my net worth uh, including houses and everything else is in the stock market. Um, so I have to do things a bit differently to you guys who perhaps are earlier in your investing journey. And so don't take this as a discouragement to start investing. Like the most important thing is get started uh, and then just put a little bit of money every month and buy the world's best companies. And so, yeah, like if you know me personally, continue to tap me up for that advice. Right. I'm still going to get you that t-shirt. Badger the market timer. <laughs> so good discussion as ever. A little bit organic. Came up with some interesting stuff. Um, you can find us on YouTube uh, and all major podcast platforms. Do please tell a friend if you found this entertaining or interesting, or even if you think we're a pair of idiots and you want to you know, tell your buddies about that. So send them a link. So do like and subscribe. Yes, and check us out also on wallstreetwildlife.com where now we have a special treat for you. In exchange for your email, you will receive 10 Laws of the Jungle PDF which has our most condensed wisdom all-in-one very shiny PDF package. Check it out. You could also see our updated King of the Jungle portfolio contest on that same very same website. We mentioned that we're on Instagram, but we're also on Twitter, like X. It's where we do most of our uh, posting. Uh, I am at 7 Luke Hallard. And I am at 7 Flying Platypus. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.